Welcome back. In part three, we're going to continue with oligopoly, but, but now we will consider game theory and specifically the prisoner's dilemma model. We'll use this to demonstrate why firms might find it optimal to collude and explain why collusion is ultimately unstable. We'll then consider some of the mechanisms for sustaining collusion. So to begin, while well, game theory is a generic, modern and applicable tool to analyse oligopolistic markets. Indeed, it could also be used to model the strategic behaviour of players in a range of scenarios, including, for instance, negotiating international trade agreements. And more widely, game theory is used in many academic disciplines, not just in economics, but also political science, law, sociology, philosophy, mathematics, biology and so on. Game theory is essentially a tool that is usefully applied when agents' actions are interdependent, i.e. their actions and strategic decisions affect one another. In this regard, individuals may reasonably be portrayed as rational maximizers. They aim to take actions that make themselves as well off as possible. In this session, we will try and show there exists a possibility for these agents to collude and in doing so enhance their own personal outcome whether that be for, you, for profit or for utility. Naturally, we will focus upon economics related contributions to game theory, which actually originated from a branch of mathematics and is associated with some of the brightest ever mathematicians to have walked the earth, namely John von Neumann and Oscar Morgenstein in the 1940s, and John Nash, Melvin Drescher, and Merrill Flood in the 1950s. The latter two are pictured on the slide. The most famous game theory model is that attributed to Melvin Drescher and Merrill Flood, who analysed the interrogation records of prisoners of war in World War II. The simple model runs like this. There are two members of a criminal gang, and we'll call them Butch and Sundance from the film. These are arrested and imprisoned. Each prisoner is in solitary confinement with no means of communicating with the other. The prosecutors lack sufficient evidence to convict the pair on the principal charge, which in this case is a bank robbery. But they do have enough to convict both on a lesser charge. Simultaneously, the prosecutors offer each prisoner a bargain. Each prisoner is given the opportunity either to betray the other by testifying that the other committed the crime, or to cooperate with the other by remaining silent. In essence, each prisoner has an opportunity to either confess or deny involvement in the bank robbery. The prisoner's choice will affect their sentence, and in economics terms we will refer to these as the payoffs, and they only have one opportunity to tell their side of the story, and what we call this in economics is a one-shot game. So the payoffs, or rather in this case the punishment, are given as follows. If both prisoners deny, then each prisoner has to serve two years each in jail. If both prisoners confess, each has to serve five years in jail. However, if one prisoner confesses, he gets one year and the non-confessor gets 10 years. If you've seen any cops and robbers shows, this type of scenario is quite common. Anyway, each prisoner knows this information and must choose whether to confess or deny accordingly. And remember, they cannot speak with one another. We can represent these payoffs in a so-called payoff matrix. Recall we have Butch and Sundance, and each of these convicts can either choose to confess or deny. Butch's payoffs are given first in each box, and Sundance's are the second number in each box. We can see that each prisoner has a dominant strategy to confess. A dominant strategy is the best one to play irrespective of whatever the other prisoner decides to do. Why? Well, let's consider Butch. Suppose he decides to deny the charge, then the worst possible outcome he faces is a penalty of 10 years in prison, 
but that will arise if the other player, Sundance, chooses to confess, and in so doing, Sundance will get one year in prison. Similarly, consider Sundance. Suppose he decides to deny. Well, again, the worst possible outcome he faces is a penalty of 10 years in prison. And this arises if Butch chooses to confess. Both players know these payoffs. And remember, they cannot communicate with one another. They will each therefore have a desire to minimise the risk of getting the worst possible sentence. And this can only be achieved if they both confess, in which case they both receive five years in jail. This is, of course, suboptimal for both prisoners, as they each receive five years in prison each. If only they could have coordinated their stories and both de denied involvement in the crime, they would each get two years in prison, but they can't. The outcome is what we call a Nash equilibrium, and more on that in the next slide. If you've ever seen the film A Beautiful Mind, starring Russell Crowe, then you'll have heard of John Nash. If you haven't, then I highly recommend it. John Nash was an American mathematician who made fundamental contributions to game theory, differential geometry, and the study of partial differential equations. Nash's work has provided insight into the factors that govern chance and decision-making inside complex systems found in everyday life. His game theory work in the early 1950s led to him being awarded the Nobel Prize for Economics in 1994. A Nash equilibrium is simply defined as the point at which a competitor is pursuing the best possible dominant strategy given the likely strategies of the other competitor in the game. At the Nash equilibrium, there is no sole incentive for either competitor to move away from that point. So if you consider the previous slide, where both players pursued their dominant strategy and chose to confess, that then at that point there was no sole incentive for either prisoner to move independently away from this position, i.e. because they each got five years, and if they did, they would most likely receive a worse sentence, in this case, 10 years. In the business world, firms in oligopolistic markets often encounter prisoner's dilemma situations. For instance, consider Pepsi and Coca-Cola. These are the two dominant players in the cola market, which is almost a duopoly. Each firm faces a choice of either tacitly agreeing to charge a high monopoly price and share joint industry profits, or they maybe decide to cheat on that agreement and cut their price to steal a rival's market share. You can probably see they face a similar choice to our bank robbers. We can illustrate this scenario in a simple payoff matrix, and we each firm has a strategic choice of whether to price high or price low. Here, Coca-Cola's payoffs are given first in each box, and Pepsi's are the second number in each box. The notional numbers in the box represent profits. They're arbitrarily chosen for illustration. Hence, they're not denoted in any currency. All that is important for our analysis is the ranking of the payoffs to each firm. A question for you to think about, what is the most likely outcome to this game? And what is the Nash equilibrium? We can see that both Pepsi and Coca-Cola have a dominant strategy to price low. Why? Well, remember, a dominant strategy is the best one to play, given the likely choices of other firms in the game. Consider Pepsi. The worst possible outcome is profit to zero, and these will arise if they price high and Coca-Cola prices low. In this case, Coca-Cola would get 10. This is the bottom left quadrant in the payoff matrix. Likewise for Coca-Cola, they face a similar situation. Both firms recognise this, and they will both play the strategy to price low. But if only they could collude and choose the high price strategy, they would both then get profits of five each. But suppose they did collude. Well, this is unstable because the incentive to cheat is great. By cheating and pricing low, you might be able to earn 10. Both firms know this, and so they end up at the Nash equilibrium where both price low and where there is no sole incentive for either Pepsi or Coca-Cola to independently deviate. So how do firms in the real world resolve the prisoner's dilemma? Well, first, they recognise their mutual interdependence, and they will often seek to collude. Collusion is essentially a form of cooperative behaviour in which participants agree to conduct activities that will limit competition. Collusion can take a variety of forms. These include price fixing or limiting output. For instance, 
Think of OPEC, which is an international oil cartel. Or tacitly restricting aggression to one another on non-price variables, such as research and development expenditure or advertising. The problem is that business collusion is now illegal. In the UK, for instance, we have the Competition and Markets Authority to oversee market competition and take action where cases of collusion arise. In many other countries, companies can be heavily fined if they are caught engaging in collusion and in some cases, senior executives can be sent to prison. There have been several high profile cases of collusion in recent years. For example, the rate to toy manufacture, school fees, airline pricing, truck manufacturers, financial markets, salt extraction companies, and so on. You'll discuss some of these cases in your seminar groups. There are two types of collusion. The first is overt or explicit collusion. This is a formal written agreement between firms to collude. We rarely observe these since, as we mentioned, collusion is now illegal in most countries. OPEC is, of course, an international explicit agreement between a number of oil producing countries. There is no legal jurisdiction to prevent this from occurring. The second type of collusion is tacit collusion. Here, there is no explicit agreement but rather each firm mutually recognises through repeated interaction that cooperation and collusion is rewarded by higher profits. But remember, whatever agreement is struck, there is always an incentive for one player to cheat, and this makes collusion inherently unstable. The real question is how collusive actions might play out in real world markets. And the answer to this question depends to a large extent on whether the game is played out once or in a finite number of periods, or whether it's played out indefinitely. In one shot or finite settings, for example, auction environments, or where the government invites competitive tenders for government contracts, then we would expect players to play their dominant strategy. And the outcome is the same in each round, i.e. we end up at the Nash equilibrium. Why is this the case? Well, that is because of backward induction. Backward induction is a process of reasoning backwards in time from the end of a problem or situation to determine a sequence of optimal actions. So in finite games, whether it is one period, 10 periods or 20 time periods, the backward induction argument is that each player will cheat in every round and collusion is therefore not feasible. Let us explore the backward induction argument in more detail. Consider a game played over five rounds between Unilever and Procter & Gamble. This is a finite game. It ends in round five. Both firms know this. And using backward induction, they will both see that the dominant strategy in the fifth round is to cheat and opt for high output. And so we'll end up at the Nash equilibrium, where they'll each earn profits of three. If both Unilever and Procter & Gamble foresee this, and we assume they are rational and should see it, then the focus is then on the fourth round as a potential opportunity to cheat. Because both firms know this, and they also know that each firm will cheat in the fifth round, they will also cheat in round four. Round four has effectively become the last round. The same reasoning occurs with regards to round three, and then round two and round one. Effectively, every round in a finite game becomes a one-shot game. Clearly, collusion is better for both firms, but the incentive to cheat is so strong and in finite games, there are limited opportunities to cheat successfully and get away with it. In many markets, however, games take place over infinite time horizons or over very long periods, and this makes collusion more likely. Repeated interaction between firms and repetition allows scope for cheats in one round to be punished in subsequent rounds. If all firms know this, and value future profits highly, then collusion is sustainable. In this regard, having a credible punishment strategy in place is critical to sustaining collusion. If someone cheats, then you need to punish them, otherwise you'll be seen as a soft touch and they will do it again. This, of course, is true in many aspects of life. For instance, personal relationships, where if somebody lets you down or fails to deliver, then you may decide to ostracize them and not be as cooperative with them in the future. The first punishment strategy is known as the grim trigger. Here, if the other firm cheats in one period, then the response is you never cooperate with them again. They have lost your trust and the game will revert to the Nash equilibrium forever. 
This might seem reasonable, but is it worthwhile? After all, by reverting to Nash forever, you will also lose out in the long run. It may be worth trying to cooperate again in the longer term. So the Grim Trigger is not really credible, and is really only a last resort option. A second type of punishment strategy is tit for tat. Essentially, you respond in kind to what your rival did to you in the previous round. So, if the other firm cheats in the previous round, you cheat in the next round. The idea is to punish your rival until any extra profits that they earn from cheating in one round or time period are erased over the long term. Then effectively, you kiss and make up and cooperate again. This should make it clear to your rival that cheating does not pay in the long term. Collusion, of course, is illegal, and also for our early analysis, it's highly unstable. But we know it exists because of the numerous cases of it occurring that we come across in the media. So how is collusion maintained in the real world? There are various, perhaps surprising, mechanisms. First, trade associations and trade bodies. These regularly publish information on prices via trade journals that can facilitate price monitoring and can help cash out cheating firms. Similarly, consumer magazines such as Witch and price comparison websites, perhaps quite innocently, can also facilitate price monitoring. Such mechanisms are important because if one firm is caught cheating on an implicit agreement, then the other firms can retaliate accordingly. The second main mechanism are what are known as facilitating practices. These take the form of price watch, matching adverts and price match guarantees. We come across these in our everyday lives, whether on the high street or conducting online shopping. Statements such as, if you find the price lower for this product elsewhere, we'll match it, sound very competitive slogans. However, they also hold an implicit warning to rival firms. That is, by making such a statement, you're saying to a rival firm, if you undercut us, if you undercut our prices, then we will match it and we will both suffer. In effect, you are threatening to revert to the Nash equilibrium. In terms of reading, there should be a chapter on oligopoly in your textbook. However, the corner model is unlikely to be in the textbook. And a warning here, if you Google it, then the version you will come across is likely to be highly mathematical. That is fine if you wish to understand the mathematics and play around with the functions but it's not necessary for this module. There are some other documents and links on Moodle to look at, and in particular the paper in the journal Post Keynesian Economics by Rob Branson, the late Keith Cowling and myself.